Happiness is humans' undeniable desire. But what makes it possible from the psychic perspective? In this episode, Dr. Marian Minerbo shares with us, in a clear and concise voice, her studies on the aptitude for happiness. The author describes brief moments of happiness and from them highlights the psychic elements engaged in making this experience possible. Firmly based on psychoanalytic theory and illustrated with simple everyday life moments, she illuminates and clarifies what she calls aptitude for happiness. Marion Minerbo, MD, PhD, is a full member and training analyst at the Brazilian Psychoanalytic Society of São Paulo. In 2015, she received an award for the best work of training analysts at the Brazilian Congress of Psychoanalysis on Contributions to a Theory on the Constitution of the Cruel Superego. She has previously published dozens of articles and books. Her new book, Notes on the Aptitude for Happiness, is in press. I am Isabel Silveira with Talks on Psychoanalysis, the International Psychoanalytical Association podcast, which is devoted to topics published in the IPA Society's journals and conferences debates worldwide, featuring the original voices of the authors. This podcast series is part of the activities of the IPA Communication Committee and is produced by the IPA Podcast Editorial Team, which is headed by Gaetano Pellegrini. Editing and post-production is done by Massimiliano Guerrieri. To stay informed about the latest podcast releases, please sign up today. Notes on the Aptitude for Happiness I will present here some fragments from my book, Notes on the Aptitude for Happiness. It was a challenge to select the most relevant ones for a 35-minute podcast keeping the spirit of the book alive. To start with the obvious, everyone would like to be happy, but not everyone has the necessary psychic equipment to do so. Happiness is more than the absence of mental suffering. It has a positivity, like when someone says, such and such a thing makes me happy. I will present some of the occurrences of happiness by means of vignettes from ordinary life. They will allow me to highlight the different elements of the psychic functioning that make them possible. The set of these elements make up what I'm calling the psychic aptitude for happiness. Because I have selected only seven from 30 vignettes, many of the psychic elements that make, the, make up the aptitude for happiness will not be addressed. Before we start, I'd like to clarify two things. You will not find here advice or exercises on how to get there. And two, aptitude for happiness doesn't mean a guarantee. It means just that it is possible and within reach. Let's go to the vignettes. They all start with a walk on the beach, a metaphor for our walk through life. Let's say I am in Costa Rica. I have just finished work and I'm going for my walk along the beach. I've been walking for two hours and enjoying the scenery. It's burning hot, I'm thirsty. I would love to have a cold beer. And here there is the small bar I was dreaming of. Being able to rest and enjoy this beer makes me happy. This first vignette is very simple. It will serve me to propose a rereading of the pleasure principle. I'm thirsty. I'm craving a nice cold beer. I have the beer that makes me happy. It might seem that happiness is the possibility to fulfill our wishes, but psychic life is not so simple. On the one hand, if this happened, 
if we managed to get rid of all tension in the psychic apparatus, we wouldn't be happy but bored. There would be nothing more to desire. On the other hand, luckily, it's impossible to satisfy all wishes. As long as there is life, the instinctual drive is there to push us ahead. It's constitutive of the human being. In a way, we are eternally unsatisfied. Does it mean that happiness is impossible? Wouldn't it be better not to desire anything, as certain Eastern philosophies suggest? The problem is that psychic life does not work that way. On the one hand, it's impossible to stop desiring. Only melancholics don't wish for anything. On the other hand, there are situations in which we fulfill our wishes and we are not bored. On the contrary, we are happy. I'm thirsty, I drink the beer, and I'm generally happy. We don't desire only what is absent, missing, or what we lack. It's perfectly possible to desire and enjoy that which exists, that which we have. In this sense, desire has an affirmative dim dimension and adds to the pleasure of being alive. We find the same difference between hunger and appetite. Hunger is the absence of food. Appetite is the aptitude or the capacity to be fully present to savor a meal. Let's return to my walk along the beach. Come to think of it, the vignette doesn't just describe the fulfillment of a desire. It's not just the sensorial level of pleasure that is involved in that experience. If I am fully satisfied by having this beer, it's because it involves my being as a whole. And this includes the context in which I enjoy that drink. In fact, it's not just any beer anywhere that makes me happy. It is this beer that I enjoy after a long walk about after, after work. And this is because, in this context, this beer makes sense to me. It adds one more pleasure to the pleasure of being alive. It is a way to affirm my love and appetite for life. To recap, we start from the sensorial pleasure of having a beer. We include the context which gives a meaning to this beer. And we end up in love for this walk in this moment of my life. Putting everything together, the desire that is being fulfilled is not only the desire to go for a walk on the beach, nor it is only the desire to drink a beer. All this is articulated to a broader desire, which is to be fully alive. In this rereading of the pleasure principle, the fulfillment of desire provides a sensorial pleasure but also a pleasure of the soul when enjoying what one loves. Desire is a first element, perhaps the most basic one, that makes up the aptitude for happiness. Let's move to the second vignette. I end my day at work and, as usual, I go out for my walk along the beach. The sun is strong I face steep climbs on this walk, and it requires effort. There is no bar to have a beer or to rest. Is it possible to suffer and be happy? As we know, we interpret reality from our unconscious. I will use this vignette to show two opposite interpretations in terms of aptitude for happiness. Interpretation 1. It's not fair that this walk requ requires so much effort from me. I want to have pleasure, not to suffer. These steep hills shouldn't exist. They should have put a cable car. They should have put kiosks with beer. They should have warned me that the path is difficult. It's disrespectful to tourists like me. I should have gone to a resort. There is beer at the pool bar, I don't need to make all this effort just to sit and have a beer. The clinician recognizes here 
reality hatred. It indicates that I am in the subjective position of primary narcissism and that primary mourning has not been accomplished. I keep expecting the absolute mother represented here by Costa Rica to fully gratify me. In this position, I feel that the absolute mother could but refuses to make my life easier. And that can only be for one reason. It's because she doesn't care about me. It becomes clear that the problem is not the effort, but how I interpret the effort. If difficulty spoils my ride, it's because I feel that Costa Rica doesn't care about me. It's a narcissistic offense. I defend myself from this pain, turning it into hatred of reality. Interpretation 2. I can interpret the same reality in a completely different way. What a privileged geography Costa Rica has. The effort of climbing this mountain is amply compensated by the view of the Pacific Ocean. Nature is totally preserved. How nice that they haven't polluted this place with cable cars, not, nor with beer kiosks. In this second interpretation, since I'm not locked into primary narcissism, I do not confuse the reality of Costa Rica with the absolute mother. She doesn't owe me anything. Costa Rica is what she is. I make contact with its otherness. It's not against me. I can like it or not. I may want to stay or live. But I don't feel that Costa Rica doesn't respect tourists, nor do I interpret the effort of the trek as a personal offense. When primary mourning has been accomplished, I open myself to enjoy what Costa Rica, in its otherness, offers me. Discovering Costa Rica is a joy. Despite the effort, the tour is a pleasure. Joy and pleasure articulate and potentiate each other, which indicates an aptitude for happiness. Third vignette. I go for a walk along the beach. The place is beautiful. Climbing the rocks and cliffs requires effort. The sun is hot. There is no beer at the bar, but the waiter offers me a Coke. Being able to rest and quench my thirst is enough. I experience a moment of happiness. I can only tolerate the loss of the object if I have the symbol of the object. But to build this symbol, a certain mode of presence of the primary object is necessary. Unfortunately, there is no place here to address the difference between primary and secondary symbolization as differentiated by Roussillon. Suffice it to say that, although the primary mourning process is an intrapsychic work, the emotional conditions for it are given by the intersubjective relationship. So I can accept the coke in the place of the beer only if I can mourn for the beer. But I can only do so if soda can stand as a symbol for beer. The coke is not the beer but it can represent the beer. Both are bubbly, cold, refreshing, quench my thirst and allow me to enjoy a rest in the shade of the bar. As we see, thanks to the symbol, I am able to mourn for the lost beer. But what exactly do I mean by primary mourning? We can define it as a process by which we manage to emotionally integrate a double loss, two sides of the same coin. On the one hand, the loss of the subjective position in which I see myself as His Majesty the Baby, to whom all is due. On the other hand, the loss of the absolute mother of early childhood. I lose the illusion 
and therefore the expectation that something or someone will totally fulfill me. It's a painful and always incomplete process, but it has two fundamental compensations from the point of view of the aptitude for happiness. First, the discovery of the other as other subject. This discovery is fundamental because many of the pleasures and joys of life are experienced in the relationship with the other. It's difficult to enjoy life if I am totally navel-gazing. I will not resume here Winnicott's ideas about the process of discovery of the other. It's enough to mention the role of the environment as a facilitator of this process. The vignette illustrates the role of the environment in the morning process. There is no beer in the bar. The bartender cannot fully gratify me. But he offers me a Coke. Look at that. His answer is quite appropriate, because when you are thirsty, a Coke is a source of some satisfaction. Naturally, I also need to be in a position to accept the soft drink in the place of the beer. For example, I cannot be an alcoholic. The second achievement provided by warning is to get out of the emotional logic of all or nothing. This logic is terrible because it taints with the colors of all or nothing every sector of our mental life. If I am not everything, then I'm nothing. If this right ride isn't perfect, then it sucks. If my partner doesn't give me everything, then he gives me nothing. Do you realize how the logic of all or nothing constantly throws us into anxiety and frustration? When I go through primary mourning, I get out of that logic and the anxiety diminishes. I can get out of my navel gazing and look around. I can discover sources of pleasure and gratification that I couldn't see before. Before the morning, if there is no beer, I'd rather die of thirst. The tour sucked. I shouldn't have come here. After the morning, if there is no beer, I'll take something else. And the ride is worth it, even if it's not perfect. As we can see, the morning process, that is the exit of primary narcissism, is the absolutely necessary condition for the aptitude to happiness. When the process is successful, the foundations of a more robust ego are structured and more resilient to the losses that life will impose. If the primary mourning process has not been accomplished, no secondary mourning will be plus possible. For example, the mourning for the lost beer. Fourth vignette. I have already settled for a Coke. After all, being able to quench my thirst is already a joy. But the waiter, who is also Brazilian, winks and says that he's going to prepare me a caipirinha. It's not on the menu, but he knows that the bar has cachaça and lemons. Grateful and happy, I accept the suggestion. This wonderful bartender helps me in the morning for the beer. But not only because he offers me a caipirinha, nor because the caipirinha is as good as the beer. It's because the encounter with an empathetic human being capable of identifying with my disappointment makes me feel emotionally accompanied. It's a joy to realize that the waiter is not just fulfilling an obligation. He's paying attention to the cost customers. He's paying attention to me. He kept looking at me while I enjoyed the caipirinha. I doubt, I doubt that he's doing this just for the tip. He likes what he does. Giving me pleasure gives meaning to his work. Without it, 
he would be condemned to the poverty of a bureaucratic coming and going from the kitchen to the tables. And from my side, thanks to him, I feel like a valued and welcome customer. My experience in the bar is not limited to drinking a caipirinha, an important pleasure in, in itself, but a sensorial one. Nor do I feel reduced to being just another customer who will pay for a service. When I receive what he has done with pleasure, I know that my existence has made a difference for him, which gives meaning to my life as well. The matrix of this human exchange is the relationship between the mother and her baby, two lives completely connected in which each one affects the other and ideally allows it to be expanded. At that moment, in a little bar in Costa Rica, the caipirinha that one makes and the other enjoys creates a brief moment of communion between two human beings. Each one accompanied the other on a small stretch of their journey through life. For a few moments, we feel at one. We feel less lonely thanks to the warmth of human connection. It's an element that makes up the aptitude for happiness. Next vignette. Today I started to write a book on happiness. After work, I go out for my walk, dreaming of having a beer in a little bar. Someone tells me that the rocks are dangerous. Another person asks me to go with her somewhere else. I gently tell the first one that I'm wearing the right shoes and will be careful. And to the second I say that today I would really prefer to take my walk on the beach. Being able to confront loved people in order to achieve what I want makes me happy. A former vignette in the book showed that one of the conditions for happiness is to be able to have agency, that is, to be the subject of one's own life, in the sense of feeling empowered to fight for what is felt as meaningful. But besides being empowerful, empowered, you have to feel entitled to live your own life. I'm talking about something very important, internal freedom. It's fundamental not to be colonized and subservient towards the primary objects and its ex external representatives. In this sense, primary mourning has one more benefit. When I discover the other as another subject, he becomes humanized. He loses the characteristics of the absolute. I am no longer submitted to it. I can confront the object without being terrified by its reaction or by the possibility of losing its love. And I can confront the object in order to live my own life without feeling guilty for causing it terrible harm. When there is internal freedom, I can make real choices. I can choose to do my walk or to forego it. If I am harassed or if I am accused of being selfish, I will be of upset, of course. But when I'm not colonized by the primary object, I know that I don't depend on it for survival. And because of this, I can afford my right to live my life according to my desire. Internal freedom from the object shows an aptitude for happiness. Next vignette. After spending hours writing, I go out for, for my walk on the beach. I face the sun and the rocks. I walk to the bar listening to a song that always moves me. Gracias a la vida que me ha dado tanto. Thanks to life that gave me so much. I am aware that I am exactly where I want to be, doing exactly what I want to do, and that this is enough for me. 
The feeling of gratitude is only possible when the primary mourning has been accomplished and the object has been discovered as another subject. I can emotionally integrate the realization that the other can gratify me or not. I know well that this bar might not exist or it might not have beer, but it does exist and it has beer. I love the life that generously offers me this simple pleasure. That is why I feel grateful. When I am functioning in the gratitude mode, I see the glass as half full, not half empty. In that moment, my experience is one of fullness because I fully enjoy what I have and what I love. The deconstruction of the absolute object and the discovery of the other as other subject determines the quality of the bonds that I am able to establish with external objects. But beware, the inside-outside relationship is extremely complex. Every encounter with an object is, at the same time, a re-encounter. I can meet again good objects in the world, feel that I receive good things, and thus feel pleasure and gratitude. Or I can meet bad objects again. In this case, there will be no pleasure and no gratitude because I won't have received anything good from anyone. In order to feel that the other can be a source of good things, I need to transfer, that is to project, my good internal objects onto them. But to have good objects to project, I need to have had good first encounters. I need to have internalized the other as a source of pleasure. The more I project my inner good objects into the world, the more I experience the world as a source of gratification, of things I can enjoy, perpetuating a cycle of good encounters and re-encounters. And the other way around, if I project into the other my internal bad object, I create a dynamic by which no external object can ever be experienced as satisfactory. And this for at least two good reasons. First, either the projective identification is effectively transforming the other into my bad object, and second, because when the expectation is couched on the absolute, anything I receive will be disappointing. To repeat, the relationship between the internal and external object is complex because the other is not a static set of personal characteristics. I can summon in the other his best, but I can also summon his worst. And this, in this case, I will end up experiencing the same painful events that took place in the primary bond. This is also true the other way round, but I will not address this subject here. Early and current experiences, the past and the present, the internal and external object, are always in a dialectic relationship. The very possibility to have good encounters in life and to experience gratitude show that several interconnected psychic processes have been successful enough and that the aptitude for happiness is present. Let's go to the seventh and final vignette. I turn off my computer and go for my daily walk on the beach. I feel invigorated by work as it is one of the things that gives meaning to my existence. Far from leaving me exhausted, being productive fills me with energy to enjoy life. The life I have built makes me happy. The life drive is the regime of mental functioning that moves the subject towards a creative life, while the death drive keeps the subject 
trapped in the sterility of repetition. When the life drive predominates, the walk on the beach and through life is pleasurable because I am happy and not the other way around. If I was unhappy, the same walk around Costa Rica would not have the same charm. The walk itself is contingent. It may or may not be. So is the beer. If I am at easy with life, I can enjoy going to the street corner. The installation of the drive, life drive is favored by good enough experiences of what Winnicott called found created. They produce joy and empowerment, confidence in oneself and in life. The installation of the life drive is also favored by the good match between spontaneous gesture and the environment responses to the singularity of the self. From this point of view, what makes me happy is to feel that I fully occupy a place in the world, a legitimate place conquered with effort, which corresponds to the development of my potential as a human being. Besides, I feel that I am fully represented by the place I occupy in life. It represents my uniqueness and makes me a unique human being in the world. I am happy to be writing this book. Regardless of the outcome, I already feel this effort as an achievement. Of course, I will be even happier if the project is successful. I will be happy to share these ideas and to imagine that others can learn and enjoy reading it. But what makes me really happy is to feel that the form this book has taken has the imprint of a personal style that it has matured over the years. When I renounce being special, I discover that I am unique just as each of you are unique. To be unique and to accomplish one's own potential is to build a meaningful life. And this is yet another element that makes up the aptitude for happiness. To get an overview and conclude this conversation, I'm going to bring together some of the elements that make up the aptitude for happiness. As we have seen, the absolutely necessary psychic condition is primary mourning. It can be considered a watershed in the quality of mental life. Thanks to primary mourning, I stop seeing myself as special and at the same time I discover otherness. My internal-external object is humanized. On the one hand, I no longer have impossible expectations towards him. On the other hand, when the other is just like me, a mere human being, I no longer feel threatened by him. In short, I gain the necessary inner freedom to make my choices in life. Finally, when I stop functioning according to the logic of the absolutes, of all or nothing, the paths open so that I can experience the pleasures and joys possible with other humans that accompany me on my journey through life. Although primary mourning is absolutely necessary, it is not enough for the aptitude for happiness. Joy and pleasure need to be embedded in a meaningful life. I am not a philosopher, I am a psychoanalyst. For me, the meaning of life is nothing grand, much less universal. I'm talking about the meanings of the ordinary life of ordinary people, the ones that lead us every day to make choices outside of the symptomatic repetition. The meaning of my life 
is what leads me to invest in what I love and to move towards what is important and valuable to me. Being able to transform the object and to some extent aspects of our reality is the purpose of psychic creativity. The aptitude for happiness depends then on two very simple and at the same time quite sophisticated conditions from the psychic point of view. To have accomplished primary mourning, which makes us capable for object love, and to be able to use our psychic creativity in order to cultivate the meaning of life out of the very matter of which it is made.